Hey, Hello. hi, Rodrigo. Hi there. Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, I'll let you do your talk and then we talk a bit later if we have questions and, and we chat a bit, okay? Sure. Let's go. Okay, thanks. So let's start with Rodrigo's talk. Yeah, uh, I'm going to try to turn off the video here while I'm presenting. And let's go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak here at Gantcom. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about something I have experienced uh, a while ago uh, when my only practical option for connecting to the internet was via an internet service provider or SP for short, which imposed or at least tried to impose uh, some quite strange, uh, to say the least, uh, limitations on how the customers could uh, manage their own networks. Uh, so, uh, as this was happening, I was not actually planning to turn it into a, into a talk, so uh, I did not extensively document it at the time, uh, so I might not be able to show you any actual screenshots or figures, but I did have uh, a few online conversations about this uh, with some friends at that time, which I have been able to find and read through them, and so I'm pretty confident that everything I want to show here uh, is a very accurate representation of what happened then. Uh, I must also note that I have had chosen to omit some identifying information about people and companies involved in order to avoid potential trouble, uh, since we will be discussing some mildly sensitive topics, but in any case, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, let's start with some contextualization, right? Uh, so right off the bat, uh, when I got a service from that ISP, I did uh, a little bit of testing, mostly with trace route, which quickly led me to figure out that their infrastructure looked like something like this. Uh, so uh, an Ethernet cable from them uh, came in into my house uh, that was uh, just a regular Ethernet cable. It was not uh, uh, like from like the, those ones from cable Internet. It was just an Ethernet cable, and that. Uh, well, I figured out via tree sprout that was connected to a switch uh, from the ISP, which was shared between myself and other customers living nearby. Uh, that switch was connected to the cloud, which, as anyone who has seen network diagrams before know, uh, simply represents a batch of network that are relevant for the discussion at hand and therefore are not illustrated here. Uh, so what's the problem was? Uh, the router the ISP has provided me with uh, wasn't really like one of those modems uh, regularly used by cable and fiber providers. It was simply an off-the-shelf Soho router, which, and Soho means small office home office. Uh, it refers to those small basic uh, routers that most people have at home, which you can find pretty much, pretty much at any consumer electronic store like the one illustrated here from VIPLink. Uh, please note that this is only an example, right? Uh, the router that was installed for me wasn't really a TP-Link model. But still, uh, that's pretty amateurish service, right? Uh, but there's more. You see that ISP did not actually provide the customers with the username and the password for configuring those routers they installed. And this was a huge problem since besides me not being able to apply firmware updates, customize settings and things like that, uh, they set up those routers with Wi-Fi enabled and standard SSID in a password which you could brute force very quickly. Uh, I had a friend who lived nearby. He was a customer of that same ISP because they were like the only ISP which was available in the region. And I confirmed with him that the password they set for the Wi-Fi, although it was not the same for everyone, followed the same pattern. Uh, so, which means it will be even easier for an educated attacker to figure out. It was something like uh, four letters and four numbers. It was uh, pretty basic stuff. Um, since the ISP did not provide us with access to the router's configurations, uh, our only options for changing the password was actually calling their support service and requesting a change over the phone, which is also pretty terrible. Uh, first of all, because it implies that every support worker uh, of that company has access to your router settings, which is pretty dangerous. Second, because you are going to have to say your desired Wi-Fi password to a random person over the phone, 
inferred because this makes it practically impossible to use lengthy random passwords such as uh, the ones generated by a password manager. Uh, like just think about having to read a 6-4 character random string to somewhere over the phone. It's not possible, right? Uh, so I started thinking that maybe I could uh, perform a factory reset on the router, uh, even though the ISP had put a safety seal over the reset button. Uh, but I talked about that with that friend of mine. He said he had attempted it before and uh, it caused his connection to stop working and he ended up having to call the ISP to send over a technician to set it up again. So the question was, uh, how did the ISP actually authenticate the router? Because, you know, a reset should not cause things to stop working. Uh, my first thing, my first thought was that was probably in Mac address filtering, but it, that should not have stopped working with a simple reset. And so there must have been something else. Uh, in any case, I took a look at the stickers on the other side of the router. I found out its MAC address. I cloned that to my PC and I tried to connect my PC directly to the Ethernet cable coming in from the ISP. Uh, that did not work. So I started looking around at the operating system network settings so I could try to figure out what was happening. And it turns out with that I was not getting any IP address, which means this network was most likely did not have a GHCP server and all the connected devices were probably using uh, static IP settings. Uh, so how can we get the static IP configuration from a router that we are not able to access, right? Uh, we cannot, we, I cannot simply log into its web panel and get the IP address from there. So what do you do in this case? Uh, this is what is the idea, to do some natural sniffing. So I turned off the router, I connected its WAN port to the Ethernet port on my PC, and I started up while I started turning on again. Uh, the router began broadcasting, broadcasting our packets, requesting an MAC address for what I guess was its default gateway. And this is what an R packet looked like. Uh, so uh, here you can see uh, our router. Uh, uh, in this, uh, this is just an example, but uh, the router here would be this device, which has the IP address 10.0.0.1. And I'm sorry, uh, it would be the device that has the IP address 10.0.0.2. And it was requesting uh, the IP, uh, the MAC address for its default gateway, which was most likely 10.0.0.1. And so uh, via this R packet, you can pretty much uh, see uh, what the router IP address was. Uh, it also sent its MAC address, but we already know, we already knew that from the stickers on the other side, and we could figure out the default gateway uh, IP address. Uh, from that, we can, uh, I just guessed the network mask at that point. And from that, with that information in hand, I connected my PC to the ISP's Ethernet cable once more. I used the same MAC address and static IP address settings as those that I got from the router from the R packets, and it worked. I could successfully connect to the internet in that manner. So uh, from that, based on that experiment, I knew I could replace the router the ISP had provided me with, with one of my own choosing, as long as it allowed Mac edge spoofing, which for, for instance, Microtech devices, uh, their home routers allow you to do that, allow you to do Mac edge spoofing. Uh, so I set, up a, I set up one of them in place of, my, uh, of the ISP routers, and that was it. I had complete access to the settings. No employees of the ISP had any means to access uh, any administrative interfaces on the router anymore. And I could set up Wi-Fi networks uh, following uh, the best security practices. I wonder if at some point someone at the ISP would notice what I did, for instance, by, not by like noticing that they did not have access to the router anymore and if they would complain to me about it. Uh, that never happened, uh, nobody said a thing. Uh, so either they never noticed it or simply did not care. 
so that's it. Is that the end? Uh, after all, I have gained control of my network segment. Everyone is happy. That's the end of the story, right? Well, it could have been. Uh, you see, after we replaced the ISP router, uh, it was just laying around with no use whatsoever. Uh, and as time passed, it started growing in that getting its password would most likely be a fun challenge. So I set out to do it. And I started to consider my options. Uh, I thought of attempting to use like some software exploit. Uh, so I started searching on the internet. I could not find any documented vulnerabilities affecting that specific model. And as I only had access to the login screen, the attack surface I had for attempting to find them for myself was quite limited. Uh, so I started thinking of open, maybe opening up the device, dumping its flash memory, uh, maybe attempting to find some debug headers. And here's the fun thing. Even though the ISP had put a safety seal over the restart button, they hadn't done the same for the screws. So you could uh, open the device up, reset it, and do anything else from the inside without uh, disturbing any safety seal at all. Uh, but what made me hold back from going down the route was that I wasn't confident enough in my manual abilities to guarantee that I was not going to damage the device while attempting soldering and stuff. And I was, was contractually obligated to give them back the device uh, once I was not a customer anymore. Uh, it could give me some headaches if I did uh, any physical damage to it. So... Uh, what alternatives were there left? Uh, so I started thinking about how did they remotely manage the router settings. Now, uh, regular modems usually do offer the ISP dedicated tools for that, like, right? So like implementing support for the TR069 protocol. Uh, but this was not really a modem. It was an off-the-shelf Soho router uh, it was certainly not even designed to be used as the gateway between the customer and the service provider networks. And taking that into consideration, I could conclude that the web panel was most likely set up to be exposed to the web, and they were probably remotely logging in into that and manually changing the settings. Uh, based on that, I did a small experiment. I set up my own PC as if it was the ISP switch, like by uh, copying the IP settings of the ISP, ISP switch, uh, which was the default gateway, and then I plugged the router's WAN port to my PC uh, in such a manner that the router thought my PC was the gateway. And then I started, I tried to scan the router with nmap for any open ports, and I didn't find any, uh, not even that of the web panel, as if there wasn't anything exposed to the web. And so even thought I guessed they were remotely managing it via the web panel, I actually had no way to be sure that that was actually what was happening. Uh, so how could I figure it out? Well, more sniffing. Uh, so in order to find out what was going on, uh, how they were able to remotely update the router settings, I decided to set up some passive sniffing. The idea was that I was going to place my PC between the ISP switch and the router, and it would transparently forward all the packets going on back and forth. But uh, I soon discovered that achieving this via software is not a uh, really straightforward task. Uh, like, it's pretty simple when we wish, say, uh, forward all traffic on a specific TCP port to another device. Uh, you can use IP tables rules, uh, maybe a proxy. But the thing is, uh, as I couldn't be sure how they were accessing the router, I wanted to forward all the traffic on all TCP ports, uh, maybe even traffic that was not TCP at all, such as UGP, ICMP packets. And this was very challenging to do via software. And at some point, I started looking at possible hardware solutions. Uh, now, if you're familiar with networking-related topics, you might have heard of network hubs and how they are different from switches. 
uh, switches for natural packets from one port to the other based on the destination's MAC address uh, hubs acts more like a dump switch uh, in a manner that all incoming packets are forward to all other ports without uh, any regard for MAC address or not even for uh, anything like uh, so if you have a device connected to a hub, it receives even packets that we not intended for them. And so I remember that, I started thinking that I needed a hub, uh, you know, so I could connect the cable coming in from the ISP to one port, the router to another port, my PC to a third one, and then I would be able to passively sniff the conversation from the PC. Uh, but there's a problem with that, that hubs are real-world technology. Uh, they're not really used anymore nowadays. They're not easy to find. It's practically impossible to find one for buying. And I did briefly attempt to locate some on Google, but all I got when searching for hubs were actually ads for switches. Uh, so I had to start looking for other options. And after a few more searches, this turned up. Well, that's not a hub. There's is something that sellers call an Ethernet splitter. And how does it work, you might ask? And the text on the product's description here and the images, it gives us a pretty good hint by saying that it does not support two connections at the same time. And this means you can use it, for instance, to connect two computers to a single Ethernet port on your router or your switch but you can only use networking on one of those computers at any given time, never both of them simultaneously. And this implies that this internet splitter uh, simply splits the electrical signals coming from the, the wires of the internet cable to the other ports. Uh, it's like the same thing as splicing three natural cables together, which you could do at home, but you know this, Splitter here seems like a cleaner way to achieve it. And I have no idea actually why there's the demand enough for these things to even exist, but I'm really glad that they do because they were quite convenient. And uh, so uh, your first thought might be of using it like this, by like, right? By connecting the ISP cable into one port, uh, the router to a second port and the PC that will do the traffic sniffing to a third one. And that's what, what I had thought of doing too before realizing that this would not work. And uh, the reason that it does not work, like if you ever uh, open up an Ethernet cable, if you like ever cut, uh, if you ever try to make your own, you'll know that on the inside, they look like something like this. They have uh, several wires and at least on uh, 10 Mbps and 100 Mbps Ethernet, like not gigabit Ethernet, the, what happens is this. When you connect the PC to a switch, uh, the TX wires, which are used for data transmissions, uh, are the green wires and the orange wires are the ones used for the PC to receive data. On the switch side, it's the opposite. The green wires are for receiving and uh, the orange wires are for sending data. So in short, the network port has separate pins for transmitting and receiving the data. And uh, while we can dump the packets that, uh, considering we are on PC, we can dump the packets that arriving on the, arrive on the receiving pins, but we normally cannot uh, dump the packets that arrive on the receiving, on the transmitting pins, right? And the problem with that setup I had shown you is that uh, the, uh, either the router or the ISP switch would end up uh, transmitting the packets and they would, would end up uh, arriving at my PC on the transmitting pins. So I could only sniff one side of the conversation, which is not what we want. We wish to be able to capture natural packets being sent from both devices. And my solution was actually, uh, if you 
cross over the, the pins. If you create a um, crossover Ethernet cable, you could uh, get somewhere like uh, you. So what I did was this. Uh, I used an additional natural cord on the PC. Uh, actually, uh, it was just an USB to Ethernet adapter that I had laying around. And I set up the cables like this. Uh, here you'll notice that one of the cables must be a cross of a cable, uh, like swapping the transmitting and receiving wires on the connectors at each end, so that packets from both sides of the conversation between the router and the ISP switch will end up uh, on the receiving pins of on both of the natural cords. And while this is not illustrated here, I also cut the transmitting wires on the cables uh, here that were going to the PC. So uh the pc could not transmit anything which could interfere with the conversation between the router and the isp switch uh why don't i shark uh you do have to set it up or to sniff packets from both natural cards and things are not always in sync so with this setup it's pretty frequent for you to see packets out of order on your dump but for my purposes, this was enough since I could still make sense of the traffic and understand what was going on between the router and the ISP switch. Uh, so now that I could perform uh, passive sniffing on the network traffic, I moved on to the next part of the plan, which was uh, involved a little bit of social engineering. And the idea was to call the ISP support and request a Wi-Fi password change while observing the traffic. So I could see how they were changing the router's configuration. And by doing that, I discovered uh, they were actually accessing the router via its web panel. And the traffic was playing HTTP, so uh, they did not have uh, any encryption, anything like that. It was on port 80. And the problem was that this normally should have been able, uh, should have been enough for me to simply read the password on the plain text traffic. But that specific router model, its web panel had uh, some JavaScript code that actually send the password to the router's backend uh, as a hash. And it was not a fixed hash like in the manner which you could simply replay it. It was uh, a dynamic hash. So uh, uh, the web panel of the browser was probably getting or generating some random number via JavaScript and concatenating that with the password and uh, before sending that to the router, like something like a one-time password, uh, uh, just like what you have on multi-factor authentication, it was probably something like that. Uh, the interesting thing here is that this was not a defense by the ISP, right? Uh, if it were uh, another router model, uh, just doing this passive sniffing would have worked. And it didn't uh, because of coincidence that that specific router model that they had uh, did this, but I'm pretty sure that they were not even aware of it. Like that wasn't the only model they, they used. So uh, at this point for my options for uh, obtaining the actual password was trying to find out some, either trying to find out some weakness related to the hashing algorithm that they used and attempting to somehow obtain the original password from the data I already had. Uh, but I think that this would be uh, very time consuming. There wasn't any guarantee that it would give any results because uh, if they had actually implemented the hashing algorithm uh, in a proper way, uh, this would not uh, lead me anywhere, probably. Uh, if, like if the hash algorithm was properly implemented if they were using a proper password. And so I ended up deciding that it would be more effective to perform a man the middle attack. Uh, because since I now knew that they were in fact accessing the router's web panel and which TCP port they were using, I didn't need to do passive sniffing anymore. I could simply use my PC to forward the traffic on that port to the actual router. 
and as that traffic was playing all the TCP unencrypted, I could modify it in any way I'd like. So the idea was to call the ISP support and ask them to change the Wi-Fi password and, and once more. But this time I would inject a JavaScript logger to the web panel, which would capture the password directly from the web browser uh, before the password was turned into a hash and submitted to the backend. And this was what my final setup looked like. The cable coming from the ISP switch uh, was connected to my PC, and that in turn was, uh, my PC was running Nginx as a proxy to the actual router web panel. And this was achieved by the proxy pass directives together with some other rules such as subfilter in order to change the original page and drag the JavaScript logger that I had written, and as well as a routing route to a local Node.js application which serves serve simply to receive the JavaScript logger data via post and store it while also showing it on the screen so I could uh, watch everything in real time. And so with that, I finally got the password. And it's uh, here's some observations. Uh, that password, uh, seen random generator, I could not identify any particular pattern or meaning in it. And from the data I captured by my JavaScript logger, I can notice that the support worker did not type the password directly into the web panel. So like uh, he did not, uh, it, uh, he probably copied it and pasted it from somewhere. And what I'm guessing uh, is that they might have had uh, access to something like a spreadsheet uh, containing a list of IP address and their respective passwords. Uh, but luckily, I had also programmed the logger to capture the data directly from the login form because if I like, if I simply uh, logged in what was being typed on the page that wouldn't have been enough because it will just have captured like the uh, the worker pressing control V on the page uh, but yeah uh, I could get the thing from directly from the form and after I so used the password to take a look at the router web panel for myself I noticed that the WAN access was restricted to a specific IP address from the WAN which explains why the port didn't show up on the LMAP scans I had mentioned before. Uh, it was because the when access to a panel was to specifically IP address. And one more thing, uh, in order to completely satisfy my curiosity here, I want to verify if that ISP hadn't been reusing the same password for all the routers they installed for all their customers. Uh, so I sent that password I got over to that friend of mine and I asked him to try to log into the router we had by using the same password and he did not succeed. So I guess they were at least using a different password for each customer after all. Uh, so yeah, they have that going in Facebook. Uh, that's it. This is the actual end of the talk. I hope you have enjoyed it. Uh, if so, you might wish to follow me on Twitter, you can message me on Telegram if you have any questions, maybe if you simply like to talk. Uh, there's also my website, which really is just a list of links to my social media profiles, but it's there if you like to visit it. And thank you, everyone. Just have, uh, does everyone have any questions? Hey, Rodrigo. Hi there. Thanks for the talk. It was mind blown <laughs> it's super technical I, I i really like to program and to be honest networking for me is the hardest part like i don't understand much beyond fetch like <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's what was super great thanks uh, uh and it's nice because i think our next talk will also be about routers and <laughs> and things like, and ancient routers i think you had an almost yeah, ancient, ancient router with. <laughs> <laughs> and well thanks do, do you have do you want to add anything else before like uh, you shared your website and socials but if you want to say anything before the next talk we have like two minutes here <laughs> no uh, like okay. uh, if anyone ha has any questions you uh okay right okay so yes yeah, so,
people are saying congrats and they, they said it was very interesting in the chat so if you want to reply to them later all right thank you